Welcome to Fireside Giants. My name is Alex with my co-host here, Anthony Rivardo. We got the Giants ready to take on the Cleveland Browns in some joint practices and in the preseason game on Sunday night. A lot of action yet to come, and I think this is going to be a great opportunity for the Giants to scout some of the Browns players, you know, and vice versa, because I know the Giants really need some offensive line talent, um, and the Browns have a plethora of it. They have a lot of offensive line talent. They've done a, such a tremendous job building that unit out. There's a couple guys that might not make the roster that the Giants could look at and say, you know, let's just trade them a seventh round pick. Let's trade them a depth piece for a depth piece. We have a lot of strength in the secondary we have a lot of strength that running back maybe we can figure something out um or just have some insider information and knowing who they might be cutting uh we're going to talk about one player in a little bit that i have in mind we're going to talk about kyle rudolph his injury situation how that is becoming a little bit concerning uh based on the fact that dave gettleman pretty much said we don't know if he's going to be healthy for the regular season which could have bigger implications for this team um we're going to talk about alvin kamara taking a shot at john mara for this new stance on taunting and yeah, we're just going to you know break down some things uh, regarding this Giants and, and Browns joint kind of practices and preseason game and a bunch of stuff coming up today. But Anthony, my friend, how are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing really good, and I'm excited by the fact that you know football season is just rapidly approaching. The regular season is almost here. We're in the second week of the preseason. I'm excited for joint practices. The Giants have not done a joint practice since 2018, which is when... The Detroit Lions scouted Romeo Aquara, who went on to record 19 career sacks with the team. So that's what Alex was referring to when he said that the Giants could potentially be scouting. Keep in mind, the Browns might be doing the exact same thing. And it's always interesting to see just how the teams practice together. Sometimes there's some fights or some drama. It could be really interesting storylines that follow these joint practices. Could be a fun time. But of course, it all just leads into this next preseason game, which I'm excited for. I think is one that we really need to keep a close eye on specific players for. Guys like Kadarius Tony, will he be practicing this week in the joint practices? Will he be playing this week against the Cleveland Browns? All storylines to keep an eye on as we push through this uh, end of this week and get into this preseason game and of course move on through the preseason to the regular season but today I am very excited to talk about Kyle Rudolph not excited necessarily in a good way but out of my concern for Kyle Rudolph and his availability during the regular season things are looking really muddy uh, in terms of his status for the regular season so not sure what to make of that but excited to discuss it with you Alex. Yeah, this Browns uh, joint practice, you make a good point there. They could be looking at our players too. I mean, not that we have that much great depth talent to work with, except for maybe the secondary there. Um, but I will say we're going to get a good look at our friend Odell Beckham Jr. again. You know, he's obviously on the Browns working his way back from an ACL injury. So we'll see if he's even practicing. Um, yeah, he, he's not expected to practice during yeah, that's the joint what I imagine. practices. But I'm sure he will go around and say what's up say to Saquon hi. and Shepard because they did practice together this offseason. They're still pretty close. Of course. And I really would love to see Kadarius Tony finally take the field and really show us something. You know, he's been working his way back. He had COVID. Apparently, he's doing really well in the classroom. But that only takes us so far. We want to see some live action. We want to get some video on tape. We want to get some some highlights from him and showing us what he can do as a route runner because we do know how shifty he is. You know, he was a guy that I think he curated a 35% missed tackle rate last season, the best of any wide receiver coming out of college. The guy's an absolute human joystick. And I really want to see him show us that because up to this point, a lot of people are already saying, is he a bust? You know, is he was he a mistake? And I know Anthony, you even said, I'm not so sure about this pick anymore. Um, but again, it's so early. You know, a lot of guys miss time. I think about Nick Bosa. The guy didn't actually show up until camp until August, like late August, right before the regular season started. And he's already one of the best, you know, pass rushers in the NFL, of course, after a larger sample size. But Kadarius Tony could easily have that impact um, as a wide receiver, really opening up this offense with jet sweeps, a lot of gadget style stuff. But at the same time, being a guy who can really thrive in pre-snap motion create a lot of confusion for opposing defenses. We need to see more of that and him just getting used to the scheme, right? I think that's the biggest thing for Kadarius Tony, getting live action in the scheme, facing off against other NFL talent, not just the Giants secondary, but other NFL talent like the Browns, who also themselves have a pretty good defense too, um, especially that cornerback position. They have some good safeties. So I'm really interested to see how the Giants approach Kadarius Tony entering this joint practice. Um, I, want, I really would love to see Kenny Galladay make a return in the coming days. I know he's been working on the jug machine, really working his way back rather slowly. Um, but already, the Giants wide receiver core is a little bit in shambles. You know, Kadarius Tony, he, he's been out. Kenny Galladay, he's been out. Um, you know, what are you thinking of this so far? And do you think, you know, they'll get try to get Kadarius some action here 
um, with the Browns. Yeah, I mean, I hope that they do, of course. I'm not so sure about the pick in the way that I'm seeing a level of concern starting to raise from the fan base, from the coaching staff, and the general manager. That's what has me questioning this pick currently, because I'm questioning how confident the Giants front office is in the selection that they made because they're already admitting yeah he is very far behind and it's something we have to deal with so that's obviously of major concern to me and it should be to all of us the fact that he is so far behind I still think Kadarius Tony in the long run will be okay I think that he is a good like a great player I thought he was an awesome prospect and I'm not concerned about him you know being a bust after one year but I just don't know if he's going to have a solid impact in his first season due to the fact that he is so far behind and the Giants coaching staff and everybody else has actually admitted that he's far behind that's where my concern is coming from the fact that he's just not ready to get on the field he hasn't been able to learn the playbook because he hasn't been out there actually practicing it yes he's in the classroom as Alex mentioned and he's learning it that way but we all know in football you really need some on the job training some of that experience to really learn these things learn the nuance of the playbook the offensive scheme not that Jason Garrett's offensive scheme is all that nuanced but there is nuance for any offensive scheme that curl curl players need to learn (laughs) curl hook hook right curl flat that's about it but Canary's Tony still does have a lot of learning to do, and he's just falling far behind, so that's where my level of concern is coming from. With Kenny Galladay, it's different. We know that he has a hamstring injury. He's dealt with hamstring injuries in the past, plus he is a bona fide star in this league, so my level of concern is not as high with him as it is with this rookie, Canary's Tony, who a lot of people question the pick in the first place. I didn't. I liked it, but... I'm now starting to feel concerned by how far behind he is getting. I'm hoping that he's able to hit the practice field really soon. I heard that Kenny Galladay was starting to do some practicing drills. He's starting to work back into the um, into the lineup or at least into the practice schedule. So that's encouraging to me. I know he was doing the jugs machine and maybe some other things on the side as well. So not worried about Kenny Galladay. But yes, my level of concern for Kadarius Tony is starting to raise. Call me crazy, but I actually am worried about Kenny Galladay, even potentially more so than Kadarius Toney, because Kadarius Toney is recovering from COVID. It's not like he picked up an injury. Kenny Galladay coming off a season where he played well, five Joe games. Joe Judge said that Kadarius Toney is dealing with some sort of injury. They just have not specified what the injury is. That's okay. why I'm confused. Yeah, there have been really sketchy with this injury nonsense. Um, who knows what it is, but the, I'm also concerned about Kenny Galladay regardless, just because... Already has a hamstring injury. This is an injury he's had in the past with that left hamstring. He missed five game, or he played in five games last year, which is already a big red flag. Already injured in training camp, doing pretty much nothing. Um, it was just a basic route. It, I don't, it's it's brewing a little bit of uh, concern in my mind, at least. And you want your number one receiver to have pretty damn good chemistry going into the regular season with your quarterback. Uh, good for him. Daniel Jones didn't play in the last preseason game, but there's no way Kenny Galladay is playing in this next preseason game. There's a shot at we at the third preseason game, but who really knows? Um, I'm concerned. You know, I don't feel really comfortable that he has that chemistry down with Daniel Jones yet. And wide receiver ones need to have that good chemistry with their quarterback if they want to put up the production that you're paying them for. Um, and then, of course, it boils down to the offensive line. What's the point of having a $74 million receiver if your offensive line is Swiss cheese? But we've talked about this before, so we're going to leave the offensive line alone for now. Um, but let's go over to Kyle Rudolph, who is a player that the Giants brought in to really offer more in the red zone. A six foot seven tight end, um, hasn't dropped a pass in two years, came into this situation with the Giants with an injury already on his foot, right? So he came to the Giants. They signed him to a two-year contract. He already has an injury with the foot. They know about this injury. And Dave Gettleman offered us absolutely nothing yesterday. In turn, and in fact, I actually walked away feeling less confident that Kyle Rudolph is even going to be available come week one. And even if he is, how much are they going to rely on a guy who had no time to practice, had no time to you know practice those those and get the reps um, down with the routes and this and the timing and the blocking scheme? How much do you really feel confident with him doing anything at all? So this is what Dave Gettleman had to say about it. He said, we are the Giants. We're going to do everything with class. We had an agreement. Ronnie Barnes signed off on it. Doc Scott Rodeo signed off on it. So we are fine. Once he went through all the medical evaluations, we didn't think that changing the contract was necessary. Um, that's what, uh, Je- that's what Kevin Abrams said. And then Gettleman went on to say, as far as football goes, I was extremely fortunate that the Giants organization, rather, sorry, this is, uh, Kyle Rudolph said this, as far as football goes, I was extremely fortunate that the Giants organization, everyone involved caught it and how they were able to handle my situation that I won't miss any football. 
Um, at this point, it's about taking each day and taking the opportunity to not only get myself healthy, but get myself better. It's one thing to get healthy and be healthy. It's another to be ready to go and play in an NFL game. So I'm taking that day by day. And Gettleman basically was like, we knew about the injury all along. We didn't go into this blind. Do you think I do this for a hobby? We knew it. We're fine. I mean, at this point, Dave, I honestly am not sure if you do this for a hobby or not because everything you say just curates more questions. He doesn't actually answer anything. He makes you more confused at whatever the hell is going on behind the scenes. Kyle Rudolph is on the verge of missing the first six games of the season if they do not sign him or bring him off the pup list before the regular season starts. So keep that in mind. If they do not activate him, if he does not pass his medical uh, by the start of the regular season, he will miss the first six weeks of the season. That is a huge thing for the Giants that they have to prepare for. And it, it honestly, it's that much more of a nuance, that much more of an annoying thing because they have to save an extra roster spot now for a tight end when maybe they needed a guy for an, on the offensive line. Maybe they needed that roster spot for another position. But no, we have to get a, we have to allocate an extra roster spot to a tight end because Kyle Rudolph and the Giants messed up his medical evaluations. And now they have no idea if he's going to be healthy, Anthony. What are you thinking about the situation? It's already starting to piss me off as you hear my voice elevate. Yeah, I can definitely hear it in your voice that you're getting pissed off. And I feel the same level of frustration and confusion regarding this situation because, again, you mentioned it. Kyle Rudolph said, I won't miss any football. To this point, he has missed all the football. He has not practiced at all. He has stood on the sideline in gym shorts and a t-shirt. That's a missing in football in my book and probably everybody else's eyes as well. That's just kind of confusing, kind of unacceptable at this point to where he said he's going to be on the field. He's going to participate in training camp. He's just not out there at all. He doesn't seem like he's any bit close to ready to return to football. And that's a super concerning thing because the Giants did invest $6 million per year over the next two years into Kyle Rudolph, despite knowing about that's this Kevin injury. Zeitler, by the way. Yeah, that could have paid for Kevin Zeitler, of course. And I thought that Kyle Rudolph would have a major impact on the season. I thought that he would be a player that the Giants would utilize in the red zone, utilize in the short passing concepts, really allow Evan Engram to go vertical and open up his game and his repertoire. But instead, it looks like it's just going to be uh, Evan Engram doing everything that Kyle Rudolph was supposed to do, plus everything that Evan Engram was supposed to do. So this is going to actually really affect Evan Engram and really affect the functionality of the red zone office offense and the short passing game for the team if Kyle Rudolph is not able to pass his physical and get off the PUP list. If he doesn't get off the PUP list by the start of the regular season, he will miss the first six weeks of the year, and that's a significant chunk of the regular season, and that really could cost the Giants big time going down this season, going down the long road of the season, and making it to the home stretch of the final games, because missing a key player like that for six weeks is not going to be easy to counteract or come up with some solution for that is a huge loss for the Giants on offense and that's going to be really difficult for them to really replace and replicate that level of production that they would get from Kyle Rudolph so again I'm confused by this situation we were told he wouldn't miss any football I was pretty confident in that and I was very excited to see him get on the field for the Giants but instead he has not participated in any football so now my level of frustration is going through the roof and my level of confusion is also clouding my mind quite a bit as well because this is a player who said he would be on the field and he just hasn't been so when will Kyle Rudolph be on the field I have no idea when he is I'm sure he'll be a good player for us but it feels like it's going to be about another eight weeks until we see the guy suit up in Giants pads so that's frustrating to me and I feel like we were kind of lied to as fans by Kyle Rudolph and by the front office yeah I mean Six million dollars. I'm looking back on it now, and I'm kind of like, and you know, Dave Gellman said, um, "We're a classy organization. You know, we're going to commit to the contract." But at the same time, it's it, it doesn't make any sense to me. You know what I mean? Like it's a business. If you if you are ready to sign somebody and you find out he has a debilitating foot injury that's going to keep him out for the entire off season program, that changes things, right? Am, am I crazy for, for that to think that? Like. If somebody showed up and was like, oh, yeah, I'm ready to go. I'm healthy. And they're like, actually, you have a foot injury that's going to require surgery that you're probably going to miss the majority of preseason and maybe some of the regular season. That changes things for me. Like, I mean, wouldn't that change things for you? I mean, that's a, that's a $6 million that you just let your best offensive lineman go instead of extending him and lowering his cap hit to probably around that number. And now we have major issues on the offensive line. You know, <laughs> it's just really confusing to me. And... And this is the one, this quote really pissed me off from Gettleman. He says, 
Like I said with injuries, he'll get healthy when he's healthy. He's working his fanny off. We'll see what happens. Like, be any more vague about this about this injury. And he does this with every player who gets injured. We'll see what happens. He's working his butt off. I'm like, Dave, like, everybody you've signed so far is injured. Like, Kenny Galladay injured, Kyle Rudolph injured, Saquon injured for freaking years now. Like, when is it that we – are we just going to start to, like, realize that, like, we should probably be targeting players that don't have freaking injury histories, like or extensive ones at least. Um, not to say these guys are bad players and they won't make an impact for us, but this is like every year there's guys riding the bench or injured or this or that, and it's like he has the same response, and it sounds like he doesn't even care. He's like, I'm just going to keep doing the same thing over and over again until it pans out. I don't know. Um, it's just pissing me off lately, and and I really want to see this team 100% healthy, and they just never are. But Anthony, like you, you heard what I, the quote that I just read. Does that also create a little confusion? I feel like he just never gives us anything, and we're sitting here like, all right, well, you didn't really give us any optimism. He's going to be ready. If he, if Gettleman knew that Kyle Rudolph was going to be ready for the regular season, he would have said so. So that clearly means in my mind he does not think, or he at least does not know if he's going to be available, which is really concerning to me. Yeah, I don't think that Dave Gettleman knows any more than we do <laughs> at this point. I'm sure he really does, but he's definitely not giving us in any information. And he definitely seems pretty uneasy about the situation, just like we feel. Because I feel like if he knew that Kyle Rudolph would be reg- ready for the regular season, he would say that. But he doesn't know that, and I don't think any exactly. of us do. Uh, and I, I do think there's a reason to be concerned for that. And of course, with Dave Gettleman, just the way that he does his interviews... I think many of you know that I'm not the biggest Dave Gettleman fan. I don't like that he really doesn't give any solidified answers. I don't like that he could sometimes come off as kind of smug towards the the members of the media. Um, And I understand some of the members of the media are pretty smug themselves. But still, there's just a level of, you know, working respect that both parties need to have. And just that's kind of a tangent, side story, side conversation to have. But still, just going on with Dave Gettleman and this whole Kyle Rudolph debacle, I know that there was a portion of the interview with the members of the media that was cut out. There was, um, you know, the video that gets released by the team where they do the interview, they post it on the Giants.com. They cut out a portion of the interview where Dave Gettleman was speaking with the members of the media. Then he went out and he released a written statement after they cut that out to clarify what happened and Basically, he said that he misspoke during that, so they cut it out, and then he released a um, statement to kind of fix that misspeak. But I don't know. The whole situation is is just really confusing at this point where he's misspeaking. He's not even giving us information. He doesn't seem to know enough information on the situation. He's actually misspoken on a couple of injuries so far throughout camp. He uh, misspoke on the Ellerson Smith injury, said that that happened during a conditioning jog and then joe judge said that didn't happen during a conditioning jog so it sounds like there's something with the two of these guys who just aren't on the same page with this communication to the media just a lot of confusing things going on here with the giants and the way that they are discussing things with the media i'm starting to get really confused with the way that they're operating but i'm hopeful that maybe this is just a couple weeks you know of some confusion and maybe they get this ironed out by the regular season but if they're not communicating well enough on this front then there could be other fronts where they're not communicating well enough on i don't want to read too much into small things like this but still you just have to keep all of that in mind when you're discussing the new york giants and the way this organization is run at large so breaking it down to the kyle rudolph situation again lots of confusion dave gettleman is not giving us any information but to me i'm taking away that dave gettleman is just as confused as we are basically i mean uh he's left us in, in a kind of in a mess here but at the end of the day it's not that serious where i'm like this this is burning to the ground you know rome is is being overrun i don't feel that's the case at the moment um but i will say that i wish he just gave us some straightforward answers like it's not that hard to be like guys like you know Kyle Rudolph, the injury is present we are dealing with it um we we do think he'll be ready by the regular season that's what we're hoping you know, but he's working his butt off. Like, that's the reality. Like, we, this is, became a little bit more serious than we thought, and he's working through it. But instead, he's like, he'll be worried. Instead, he comes out with comments like this. You know, like I said with injuries, he'll get healthy when he's healthy. Like, I, that just, that is the most annoying comment. That is the most annoying statement. Like, just reading it out loud just pissing me off. Um, but that's Gettleman, you know. Like, he just, he kind of has a way of just annoying everybody by, by, with these weird quotes and stuff. But, 
Let's move on to John Mara and Alvin Kamara calling him corny because that really made me laugh. And basically, if you're, if you're not aware, the, the NFL's cracking down on taunting um, and, like, you know, I guess unsportsmanlike stuff. But there was one play last week where a running back made, like, a nice run. He got up, and he just was really excited and, like, kind of jumping around a little bit. And I was like, that's totally fine. Like, he's, like, a practice squad guy. He made a nice play, and he's really excited about it. They called a flag. It's 15 freaking yards, man. Like, that's a lot of that's a lot of yardage uh, to be calling to get excited about a play. And John Mara, who probably has never played an organized sport in his entire life, is like, that's something we discuss every year in the competition committee. We get kind of sick and tired of the taunting that goes on from time to time on the field. We try to balance the sportsmanship with allowing the players to have fun, and there's always a fine line there, but none of us like to see that. It's just a question of whether you can have rules that can be enforced and without taking the fun out of the game too. But nobody wants to see a player taunting another player. I know I certainly don't. I think the rest of the members of the competition committee feel the same way too. All of, I guess the competition committee is, is literally a group of older white guys who have never played sports before because after playing like any organized sport, you get excited after doing something good. I, I talk more shit in my indoor soccer league than these guys do now, um, and, and we have a great freaking time. So it's like <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous to me that you know watching some of the examples they put forth last week in the, in the unsportsmanlike conduct that they are now perceiving, which is like just getting excited about a nice play that you made – is kind of ridiculous. You know, like turning around and just like, I don't know, looking at another player who tried to tackle you and you broke his ankles or something. Like that's part of like professional sports. Like if you can't handle that as a professional athlete, give me your $5 million and I'll gladly get talk shit to all day long. Like no problem. Um, but at the end of the day, like there is a line, you know, like the only thing that Mara said that did make sense, there is a line where it goes from like taunting to just, un- you know, to sportsman-like conduct. So um, there is some excessive stuff that does happen, which should be cut out, but the minor stuff and just like, you know, getting up and like flexing or something, I don't see a big deal on that. I think you're just getting hyped. You're getting passionate. You're, you're honestly bringing the energy out of everybody, which then makes the game more physical and more fun for everybody. Um, and then Alvin Kamara was called in corny, which I was cracking up about because I do agree. Like some of these, some of the best players in the league do uh, just taunt like they are that and it makes it exciting like OBJ when he would when he would wave goodbye or like when Saquon Barkley threw the peace sign up like that's that's what they're saying like that that's what they're considered taunting and it's just like like that's fun like I love that crap when Saquon Barkley is running 50 yards on the sideline saying peace to the Eagles defensive backs chasing him that's like the that's the best thing in the world and they're gonna call a flag on that you know what I mean it's ridiculous Anthony what are you thinking about this situation yeah, I think that when John Mars said that no one wants to see this level of taunting, I think that he's completely wrong and he's not listening enough or paying enough attention because I think there was like a million t-shirts sold of Antoine Winfield Jr. giving Tyreek Hill the peace sign in the Super Bowl. Like people love that stuff. It is part of the game. It's part of what gets people excited for Sundays and they like to see the competitive nature and a lot of what goes into that taunting oftentimes it's just players being excited because they made a play themselves they put in all that work every single day they go to practice they bust their asses they grind all damn day to try and improve as a player so that they can put themselves in position to make plays so when they make that play they feel like all of their hard work finally paid off and they want to celebrate that and I don't blame them they should celebrate that this is their job they're achieving their job at the highest level when they're making a play and they want to celebrate their success and they should be able to so I don't agree with John Mara I'm not going to sit here and bash John Mara the way that Alvin Kamara did I'm not going to call him any names or adjectives but I do think that John Mara should probably revisit this and put in a little bit more research time and effort to discuss this with some more people and understand that this is part of the game it's a way that the players express how excited they are for achieving their great success and it's also a way for fans to get more invested in the players the players emotions and really enjoy the product that they're putting on the field in terms of their performance because it is related to their performance they're taunting when they make a good play so i just think it's something that john mara maybe needs to revisit with the competition committee and maybe have a longer discussion about yeah, but I'm like, I'm like, just think about it for a second. Hakeem Nicks, dirty bird against Atlanta Falcons after that touchdown in the postseason. Is that a flag? You're still, allowed to, you're still allowed to celebrate in the end zone. I don't think that they've done anything about that. They're talking about when you run over a guy and then you stand over him and you yell at him. They want to okay, get rid of that because they feel okay, like that can incite fights. That's that's fine with me. If, if you're trying to, yeah, inciting fights, stuff like that, like if you're, if you're flexing in his face and you're standing over him and yelling at him, like that makes sense to me. Um, but I but I didn't see that last week. They called a flag on a play that was like totally normal. The guy stood up, um, yeah, and like and literally just looked back at him and like and just and just yelled though, like, out of excitement. It was kind of kind of weird. Yeah, what I'll say though is that 
preseason is not only preseason for the players, it's preseason for the coaches, for the and it is preseason for the referees. So they're trying to understand when they threw that flag, yes, that was something that players reacted to, but they heard that reaction. This is their preseason as well. So they're going That's to say to that reaction, okay, maybe let's go forward and not throw a flag on something like this, but let's take another example that we find in the preseason and throw a flag on that and see how they react. So right. it is preseason and I hope for the refs. The they're just ironing this out. Yeah, I hope so, I hope too. that's the case. Because cause I remember the whole uh, like offensive pass interference thing uh, or the defensive pass interference, like how you couldn't get away with anything. You know, you looked at the guy wrong and they, and they gave you a flag. Uh, that one year they tried to kind of crack down on it. And then, of course, you have like the rushing, like uh, roughing the passer, where like guys would literally be like, poked and you'd have a roughing the passer. Like it, it also opens up the door for flopping and other like stuff like that, where people like, and I've seen Cam Newton do it multiple times. Um, it's, it's, you don't want to mess with things too much, but I do get that there's a line that you don't want to cross with the taunting. So I do think if it's excessive, um, they should 100% be throwing flags for it. But I don't want it to get too, so soft where we're like, getting hit with 15 yard penalties because you know we're just having fun here we're just like being passionate about a good play uh so hopefully you know they they use this as a sample size as you mentioned like a preseason sample size and iron it out and figure out what a good middle ground is um and i do think that a lot of players reacted to it saying it's just funny to me because a lot of the actual active players were like this is corny this is ridiculous and then some of the older players like we don't want to see it anymore but i think it's because they're employed by the nfl now so they kind of have to say it um, but I will say, I hope they kind of maintain that the passion, the energy and, um, you know, everything kind of stays similar, but you know, they get rid of the taunting, like excessive taunting and fighting and inciting stuff like that. So hopefully we'll see a good balance unfold here, Anthony, but I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of fireside giants before the giants take on the Browns on this Sunday, but also have some joint practices. There is one player that I do want you guys to keep an eye on during the joint practices and the preseason game, uh, Drew Forbes, an offensive lineman for Cleveland. Um, he's a guy who really is a back end of the roster. They're giving him about a 30% chance to make the roster, but he's low-key pretty good. He's a guy that I would love to, to scoop up or even trade like a seventh-round pick down the road for, a sixth-round pick. Like he's the kind of guy I would I would grab over a Keon Crossin or, or whatever um, because he really does have some value there. They were talking about him being a potential starter two years ago over Wyatt Teller. Um, and then he opted out last season. He's pretty talented, and I think the Giants need more guys that have that type of potential, at least in a depth spot. So, you know, hopefully maybe he will become available. He's a guy the Giants can scout, and maybe we'll see um, them acquire Drew Forbes, Anthony. But do you have any last thoughts before we uh, sign off here? No, I'm just excited to watch these joint practices. I'm sure we're going to get a ton of, you know, interesting videos from the Giants media team. And then, of course, excited for this preseason game. Keep in mind that cuts are coming up. I know that the final cut uh, after the the final wave of cuts after the Patriots game is going to be like over 20 people. But I believe the roster has to get trimmed down by, I think, 10 spots in the next week. So keep an eye on that. Some of your favorite players, roster bubble, bubble players, might get popped off the bubble. But hopefully, you know, we get some pretty interesting standout performances in this next preseason game and some of these guys can solidify their spot on the roster for at least another week it's going to be interesting to watch these young players compete and of course do keep an eye on any cleveland brown players reserves any backups that do stand out in that sunday preseason game because of course the giants are going to notice that especially after practicing with those players for a full week they're definitely doing some scouting during this week and during that uh, preseason game so keep an eye on everything be watchful but of course if you can't be that watchful we will be watchful for you stay tuned to fireside giants we have all the information you need Absolutely, my friend. So I hope you enjoyed this video. As always, make sure to subscribe below on Apple, Spotify, and YouTube. And we'll catch you guys on the next video.